This is Tell Me What to Read, the podcast from booktopia.com.au. I'm Mark Harding, and today I am very happy to be bringing you three conversations with some incredible authors. First, best-selling crime writer Christian White talks about his new book, Wild Place, with Ben Hunter. And then, Jacqueline Moriarty talks about her new book, The Astonishing Chronicles of Oscar from Elsewhere, with Sarah McDooling. And finally, media icon Lisa Wilkinson discusses her memoir, It Wasn't Meant to Be Like This, with Stefania Campogna. Check the show notes for timestamps for all of these conversations. Now it's over to Ben for his chat with Christian White. Christian White, thanks for being back on the Booktopia podcast, even on this Zoom format. It's so good to see your face again. It is an absolute pleasure to be back. Uh, we were just saying before we started recording that last time we did this, we was in a real room. And so hopefully, hopefully next time I'm on is in real life. But this is a good, um, this is a good compromise, I think. It's nice to sort of be there with you. Yeah, it's been a wild couple of years. Um, how are you? How's, how's the Greyhound? Uh, she's good. Yeah, she's currently laying with her head directly under my back wheel of my desk chair. So I'm, um, so I'm yeah, sitting forward really strange, but she's great. She, she actually looks like she's dead, but she's really not. She's, uh, she's just very, <sighs> very still. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a cat wander past yeah, her. Yeah, that's my Lola. Oh, there it goes again. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's, doing, she's doing the rounds. Good, um, good. Wild Place, I've set, I think I've set a land speed record reading this novel. It's um, just propulsive and gorgeous. Uh, congratulations. Oh, thank you um, so, so much. Thank you. It centers around a disappearance, a small community, and um, even beyond that, that hook, it's 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 about the wild things that a community does in response to that disappearance. Uh, do you want to do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, the quick uh, the quick pitch is it's about a woman who goes missing, uh, about a young a teenager who goes missing, um, and from this little sort of suburban town uh, in the 1980s. And her, one of her school teachers, he's on school holidays, he's got nothing better to do. And he kind of just starts his little own little investigation um, and it leads to um, some crazy places. And it was strangely inspired by, you know, it's, as he said, it's been the weirdest couple of years. And even before that, you know, for the, for the, five, for the past sort of four or five years have just been really, really strange. Um, but it kind of helped with the writing of the book. You know, it's about um, it's about satanic panic, which was this wave of mass hysteria that swept the entire world, America specifically, but Australia, the UK, uh, in the eighties and nineties, where all of a sudden parents were genuinely scared that their kids were getting um, brainwashed and uh, by, by satanic cults and heavy metal records were dangerous and and all of this crazy stuff. And um, and I've I've wanted to write about satanic panic for for years and years and years, but it always seemed really, really sort of too silly. It seemed, I couldn't quite find an angle because it seemed so silly to me looking back, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, over the last few years, um, the, it's sort of like we've seen an evolution of satanic panic where with QAnon and all the conspiracy theories and now with the pandemic, um, you know, all, all of the, you know, Hillary Clinton drinks blood, uh, the, the the COVID vaccine has got tracking devices. All of this stuff was happening around me, and and it wasn't it wasn't crackpots. It was it was people in my life, you know, who who were believing this stuff. And and all of a sudden, it forced me to. Well, firstly, firstly because I, because it was you know first I argued again you know argued had these dumb arguments that that went nowhere. But then I sort of started to empathise and really try to understand why why people's standards of evidence drop when they're scared and all of this sort of interesting stuff. And suddenly it occurred to me, Oh, this is satanic panic. I'm, I'm, I'm living it. I'm starting to understand it. And, and I'm under, trying, starting to understand what, what fueled it. And, and that sort of really allowed me to, to, to set this story back in the late eighties, but kind of a little bit of write about what was going on today. Uh, you know, that the main character, Tom is such a kind of, um, he's just a, a very average, boring, middle-aged suburbanite. And he just, he just gets sort of swept up in these ideas and, um, and, and that's what's happening around me. So it was, it was sort of a bit of a, it was a bit of an outlet, I think. That's a really interesting way of using 
fiction to examine the incomparability of our, of our own time at a, at a really specific time and place, you know, a really specific cultural moment. Uh, why don't you take our listeners back to the very last weeks of the 1980s? Because it's, it's very specific, this novel. It is, it is December 1989. Um, yep. You know, Christmas lights are up. The weather is hot. We're in a um, we're in a uh, a suburb past Frankston going Mornington Peninsula way, right? So yeah, the houses exactly, are yeah. big and it's on the bush. Uh, yeah, what what would you what sights would you see? What smells would you smell? What music what would, would be in the ears? That that for me was that's just my childhood, you know. So that yeah, so the hmm. the book set in eighty nine and it's set in that. Uh, something else that interests me and I do not know why, but that week between Christmas and New Year's, it's just so weird and quiet and strange. So the whole book is set really between the, you know, in that strange little time. Um, and, and, and that's sort of, you know, uh, my childhood, you know, I, I have such, it was such a nostalgic time, the eighties. And, and I think the eighties have become sort of, um, like the new fifties, you know, there's a certain generation that was obsessed with the eighties because I was obsessed with the fifties because they grew up in the fifties. And I think now that's happening with the eighties because creators now grew up in the eighties. Um, and so I, so for me, it's a very nostalgic time, but also this, this, um, th- there's these different, this, these tension going on because on one hand, there's no, bi- no mobile phones, kids, we're allowed to stay out late. You know, you, you could, you ride off on your bike for the day, but at the same time you had uh, stranger danger and neighborhood watches prop, uh, popping up. And so there's this sort of real tension there where, Oh yeah, you're, you've got more freedom, but also you've, you've got a boogeyman now. So, I, so there's something really kind of interesting about that. And, um, and the more I started to think about it, um, the more I kind of went back there, I have a terrible, terrible memory. You know, someone in an event recently said, they asked me about a character in one of my books, a, a main character. And I, they said, ask me a question about Ray, who was, who was one of the main characters in Wife and the Widow. And, and I said, sorry, who are you talking about? Who's Ray? I've completely forgotten. So I have a terrible, terrible memory. But the more I started to write about that time, the more memory started to come back. And, and for me, it's just this, um, yeah, hot days, um, re- really, really long days. And, and school, school holidays where, you're at the beginning of school holidays and, and the end of school holidays was too far away to even think about. It was a million years away, you know, so there was this freedom, but also this boredom. And uh, I don't know, it was, a, it was a, it was a wonderful time and a strange time as well. Who knows if I answered your question there, but um, yeah, it was a, it was a love affair with the eighties. <laughs> I love that. And you've touched on the neighborhood watch thing of which, you know, Tom is, Tom is a, a member and he's mm. kind of a, your hero, Tom, uh, he's, he's, he's a member in name. He kind of goes along to the thing, but he's, he, he, he's not active and, until this um, disappearance kind of just captures his, um, it just it becomes obsessive, right? Um, mm. Everyone does in a way. Um, but, yeah, the Neighbourhood Watch is its own kettle of fish. Uh, we yeah. had one in my neighbourhood uh, when I was a kid, and I assume it's still there. Uh, if if people haven't heard of them or or ever participated in one, what's what what goes down in a neighbourhood watch, and, and what what do they actually achieve? Yeah, it's just they're 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 you know a little group. So you know, generally it'll be a street or a little community, and they'll all get together. Uh, usually at someone's house, and just just kind of talk about the, the, the bad things that are going on in the neighborhood. And, and usually these things, you, th- these things were, um, you know, in the book, it was things like they need to put a speed bump up on the street because people are driving too fast here you know, and, and, and someone's gnome is stolen and who stole this gnome. And they're the most, you know, the sort of trivial things usually. Uh, and I, I love, there's something so funny to me about neighborhood watch groups. And it actually originally one of the very early ideas for the book was, it was all going to be about the neighborhood watch group. And, and the title was originally neighborhood watch, you know, um, because there's something interesting about these people who, who don't really have anything better to do. And, and that you, I think boredom fuels suspicion sometimes. And then I thought, what if 
in this neighborhood watch, suddenly there's a serious mystery that, that they want that, you know, that, that needs solving. And it's, it's, it's a situation where you, I think it's a tragedy when it, obviously whenever any missing a person goes missing is an absolute tragedy, but people love it. And it gives them something to talk about and gives them something to think about and, and be engrossed by it. And there was something, there was something about a neighborhood watch group that I knew I wanted to write and create. And, and now it ended up being about, they ended up featuring, but it not, it's not all about them, but there's about, I guess three chapters um, or three or four chapters. There's a couple of neighborhood watch party groups. And then there's a, a new year's Eve party where all the neighborhood watch people are at. And they, those scenes were just so fun to write because it was sort of just making, it was just these sort of really silly, colorful Australian characters. And, and I just kind of let them go nuts. And you know, they, they were so fun and silly to write. And, you know, it's a, it's a thriller. It's a crime book. So I, they, they kind of bring this, um, I think levity to it and not comic relief at all, but they, they bring a lightness to it just, just by, by being there. I love that. You know? so I, so, yeah. I love I how much really fun, fun you can have in a thriller like this uh, with, yeah. with characters like yours. Um, yeah. The neighborhood watch group were, were, were particularly funny. I, I, I very much like, you know, if, I, th I think the book itself is worth the price tag just for the perineum joke you make um, early on. Uh, look out <laughs> Thank for you. That. Yep. <laughs> that's got them hooked. If they weren't going to buy it already, uh, that's got them hooked now. <laughs> <laughs> Gone for the thrill, stay for the perineum. <laughs> um, but your characterizations, and, and you, you, you've, you've been dancing around this a, a lot. Uh, you know, I'm, when I try and describe this book to people, having just read it, it's yeah. I say it's it's about it's a it's a mystery about a, a, a missing girl, but I say it's it's not that cliche. It's 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 about what a community becomes when something you know catalyzes uh, all of the angst and fury and yeah, as you say, satanic panic. Um, in, and through that, you've, you've crafted these gorgeous characters and you do this thing, and I guess all thriller writers are meant to do it, but I think you do it best, where you make them likeable, but you also make the reader stand at just a safe distance from them and, and question every, every second word. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, it, man. That's great. <laughs> uh, who 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 did you enjoy writing the most? Like I'm I'm you know Tom is great. We've mentioned Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Sharon, uh, a detective who who comes in and out of the story. She's got her own thing going on. The two parents of the missing girl Tracy are both brilliant in their own right, and they're going through a divorce, so they're separate for um, almost all of the novel. Mm. Uh, and then Tom's sons, Marty and Kieran, are awesome. And they're, they're, they're great all around. So who, oh, who, who, was, who was a challenge to write and who do, who do you love writing the most? And is it the same person? Uh, yeah, I think, I think this is for all three of... Uh, all three, so there's, there's, um, there's a few central male characters. So this is the first book I've ever written with a, a male protagonist. Um, and so Tom, I kind of drew, a, drew, for the first time, really drew a lot of myself... Uh, you know, you, you stitched a lot of myself into him, but there was also two other characters, Sean, who is sort of the weird uh, dress in black gothic teenager who lives next door, and also Tom's son, Kieran. And they're sort of at different stages. And I I drew, there was so much of me in all of those characters at each of those stages of my life. You know, what, you know, I sort right. of... 11 and 12, I was this, I was really into war and armies for some reason. And I was this sort of, really free teenager. And then I kind of, when I, when I, when I moved into my teens, I started dressing in black and I was got a sort of a bit weird. And then now I think uh, I'm, I'm a little younger than Tom. I'm 40 and, and he's 44, but now I'm becoming this sort of, um, you know, married now. And, you know, so, so I think I, I drew, they were, all of them were really fun to write because for the first time I was really speaking from experience, which I, I've, it sounds weird because I think most authors do this, but, and I think I did with the previous two books, but never so intimately. Um, I gave them a lot of a lot of traits that I 
I don't know. I wouldn't ordinarily. I just gave them a lot. Like for example, I it, it, the character Tom has Tourette's, and I have Tourette's. And you know, these things that I sort of thought. I don't know. I gave them these things and it just was it's such an enjoyable experience to write those characters. As far as hard characters go, I think um, Owen, who is uh, the missing girl's father, I love him, but he's also a bit of um, a bit of an enigma. And he's sort of a guy who, you know, I'm, I'm glad you say that all my the characters were likable because I, I really like making all my characters, give them giving them a dimension and making them, you know, not good or bad, but just that middle, because we all, that's what we all are really like. But Owen is the kind of guy, out of all the book, Owen's the kind of guy who I really wouldn't want to hang out with. And he's, and it's not because he's a bad guy. We're just really, really different. So he was always a challenge. He was always a challenge to write. Um, and it was tricky. There's also always this tension between plot and character where you really want certain things to happen, but then the characters end up dictating it. So, so there's a lot of tension there because... Mm. Um, you know, I won't spoil anything, but as you say, you sort of, it is about a missing girl, but it, it's not really about that. And, and it, there's, it takes a bit of a right turn. And I always knew what I wanted it to take that turn, but it's a difficult thing to get your characters there. So Owen, Owen in particular was a tricky, um, he was a tricky one. He was a tricky one, but I, now, now I really, I, I like, you know, I, I like the character, but now, um, but yeah, he was tricky to get in his head, I suppose. It's it's um it's gorgeous stuff to read. I it's interesting hearing hearing that. It to me it's I, one thing I really love is the aspects of grief that come into it. There's mm. there's obviously there's grief for this missing girl and that you know hole that puts in the community. But then so much of what is is going on is grief for failed relationships, grief for um. Uh, Tom's other son, Marty, moving out of home. You know, that's, mm. that, that family breaking apart. And um, Tracy's parents, as I mentioned, they're going through a divorce. Um, there's, there's all these kinds of ruptures and failures and they kind of just coalesce of, in mm. a sense a, around <laughs> the, the missing person. Um, how, how, do you, how do you work with grief and how do you think it works on a community as a whole? Yeah, I, I love that you said that because, you know, quite often is this great thing where you you write, you know, I, I think I, I keep themes in mind while I write, but mo most of it comes about naturally. And it just occurred to me, at, you just told me that, about the grief in there. I'd, that I'd never considered that, but you're so, you're so true. And it's kind of, um, you know, and the whole book is about, uh, you know, it's the end of the eighties, but it's also this small community. And there's a sense that it's a safe community. And there's a sense that things are ending, you know, the, the eighties is ending. Uh, there's this outside threat. Safety is going to go. And there's all these, um, uh, you know, th there's these, there's sort of dark things coming. So, so I guess, I guess all those, you're right. All those things are different forms of grief. Um, but that was completely by accident. So I, I don't, I, I, yeah, that was just a, a happy mistake. You know, though, in about six weeks, someone will ask me a question and I will steal that. And I'll say, well, you see, it's about different types of grief. And I'll, def I'll rip you off there and, and pretend I, I intended that, but I absolutely didn't. You can, you can keep that. I'm going to keep the perineum joke. Great, um, great. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is book number three. Uh, you've been in the craft and you've been in the spotlight as an author for years now. Uh, what's changing? Uh, are you, do you find you becoming braver with books and, and, and what you attempt to do or uh, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed that you you've stayed on this vein of thrillers and the domestic, but you've, you, you ask different questions in every book mm. and you, we've met some really different characters. So every, everything I've gotten from you has kind of satisfied um, that thirst for just propulsive, really readable, really Australian novel. Uh, but there's, there's different stuff every time. Uh, how do you think the craft has changed and what, what I guess, what, what are you going to do next? Yeah, I think, I think I'm getting, uh, in a sense, I'm getting more confident, but in another sense, I'm 
just as terrified and riddled with insecurities as ever. Um, I think putting anything out into the world, especially, you know, while we're recording this, it's the day before my publication date. So who the hell knows how the world is going to take it. But um, so I think there's a, there's a bit of a fear, but there's also, I think having, having a few successes already, you can go, okay, if people hate this one, then they'll come back for another one. You know, I think you have one dud in you. I don't think this is a dud, but I, so, but it makes you feel a bit more confident, um, I suppose. But also, I I want to take risks. Every book I want to be, yeah, new and different and, and bold. I really want to take risks. You know, part of the reason, um, but, you know, part of the reason this book has a male protagonist is because the story he needed to be male. Like when you read the story you wouldn't buy a woman doing it um, because it's stupid um, and men are stupid largely. Uh, but, but that was, that, that was part of it. But also part of it was, uh, I don't want, I don't want anything to feel too familiar and I don't, I never want to get into a mold. So I don't want to be the guy who writes female protagonists. You know, I just want to, so I, I I'm constantly trying to, um, you know, shift things around the, the, the uh, and sort of, and be bold and take risks. And I think, readers value that you know it's a tricky line to walk because the sort of books i like to read when i read an author that i love i want them to be i want them to give me a lot of new things but i also want them to feel familiar but not too familiar you know it's a really tricky line um to walk but my my very sorry for being so pretentious but my uh, writing philosophy is to um, just write things that I would want to read. So as long as I'm always, um, you know, as long as I'm always doing that, then hopefully I'll find an audience because I'm a sort of a regular book reader and hopefully I'll find people um, like me. Christian White, thank you very much for being on the Booktopia podcast. If you want to get a copy of Wild Place, do it right now from booktopia.com.au. Now, Sarah chats with Jacqueline Moriarty. Hi, I'm Sarah McDooling, and I'm so, so very delighted to be talking today to just one of my favourite people, Jacqueline Moriarty, about her new book, The Astonishing Chronicles of Oscar from Elsewhere. Hi, Jacqueline. Hi, Sarah. You're lovely. Thank you so much. Now, for all the people listening who may not have been as lucky as me to have read this book already, could you just tell them a little bit about what they can expect from The Astonishing Chronicles of Oscar from Elsewhere? Sure. The Astonishing Chronicles of Oscar from Elsewhere. Luckily, I had the book beside me, so I could just check that I was saying the title right then. I got halfway through and thought, am I going in the right direction here? Uh, is the story of Oscar... It, it opens with Oscar, a 12-year-old boy who is a skateboarder and likes to skip school occasionally. And it opens with him in the deputy principal's office where he is often sent because he's a pretty naughty. But on this occasion, she is asking him to explain where he was for the last five days. So he has missed five days of school. And it turns out that Oscar had um, skipped school gone to the local skate park and found his way through to a whole other world and the other world is the kingdoms and empires where he meets um, Imogen and a group of other children who you might know from other kingdoms and empires books if you've read them and they have five days in which to save an elven city from being crushed. I think that's the story. Is that the story? That is. That is, that's the story I read and, and thoroughly enjoyed. Thank you so um, much. The book ha has sort of two things that um, you're really great at from, I mean, it's got many things, but two things that I associate with many of your books that I really love, which is like the narrative style flipping between Imogen and Oscar as they give their accounting of these um, days is sort of, a little bit like that epistolary style that um, that I've like loved from your pre some of your previous books, and you've also this is a this is a portal world where and you're, we're no stranger to portal worlds with the colours of Madeline. So I, I I loved 
that those two elements were part of this book and it just got me thinking a lot about um, how what it was like for you, like writing another book where it's sort of set in our world but, but another world as well. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for noticing those two things. That's interesting. I didn't think of it in that way, but you are right. Those are two of my favourite things. The disciplinary <laughs> aspect, I've always loved writing uh, different perspectives. And this seemed important to me, especially important to me in this book, because partly because of the portal aspect, the fact that Oscar comes from another world. So I wanted to have his perspective in finding that other world very strange and new, but it also seemed important to have Imogen, someone who lives in that world and who finds him strange and new. And that, that's, I, I like to do that so that we can get to know a character from all in, in, from different directions and in a multi-dimensional way, especially with someone like Oscar who has an idea of himself and who he is and, and doesn't think he's all that great, even though he puts on a show of feeling like acting like someone who's super cool. But within his heart, he doesn't really think he's worth much. Um, and so we needed somebody else to be showing us that exactly how much he is worth, I think. So that's why I love, that's one of the reasons why I like different perspectives. And I like coming at a story in pieces. I always like to, you know, break up stories into fragments and then put them together like a jigsaw puzzle rather than just following a narrative because I think that's how life works mm -hmm. it's in fragments and pieces and you and the story is is never just one single strand it's always multiple billions from different time space anyway so that's one as aspect of your question and the other is what you're asking about the portal aspect so the kingdoms and empires books this is the fourth book in in the series and each book is standalone but the whole time i've been writing them i've been thinking I want eventually to find a way to get someone from our world into this world because those are always the kind of fantasy books I like. I almost didn't even like, when I was growing up I read all kinds of magic fantasy books, they were my favourite, but my favourite always were the kind where it's us and our world and we are finding a way like a crack through or a, or you know, the back of the wardrobe, or climb the tree and at the top of the tree, there's a way through. And I remember being at a, a conference of um, YA and children's writers once and um, an author who writes science fiction was on the stage talking about how she does not like those kind of portal fantasy books because it's not realistic, you can't get there. She likes science fiction, a kind of imaginary futuristic science fiction because then she can actually believe it's real because this could actually happen in 100 years and it was very um, funny because I was thinking no 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 we're not going to be here in 100 years so we can't get there but the magical fantasy worlds that you can get to through a fantasy I absolutely think I can get there so how I, I just <laughs> basically so I want that because I want to be able to get there and I want the children reading it to feel like they can get there too if they want to. That just sounds like an extraordinary failure of imagination on the part of that, that <laughs> author. No, um, she's an author with, I don't mean to be unkind to her. She's <laughs> a good imagination, a wonderful imagination. In a way, we were being exactly the same, where we both, her imagination allows her to project herself into the future and mine allows me to project myself into another world. So. I can see that we, in a in a sense, we were both. I want to be there, so I'll get myself there. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's wonderful having a character from our world in um in this world. It's like allowed for so much. Oscar's perspective allowed for so much sort of viewing of the of our world that through the lens of kingdoms and empires that I just love. Like there was lots of little. Uh, passages where Oscar is thinking about the technology that exists in our world that doesn't exist there yeah. um, and how and how magic does exist there but doesn't exist in our world and mm -hmm. I just feel like how much fun was that for you to play around with those ideas because I think reading it I just felt um, so excited for all the kids who are going to have these thoughts prompted, <laughs> right? Because in a way, technology is like magic a little bit, but also 
you know, the way the kids in the um, Kingdoms and Empires world sort of eventually make some comments around to the tune of like, oh, we don't want too much technology. <laughs> like, I I had so much fun. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really glad you, that you found that fun because I was hoping that readers would because I really enjoyed writing this and I felt like I was with Oscar seeing the world. And it, in a sense, it, it was influenced and inspired by uh, living, I don't know if you've spent much time living in other countries, and I know we can't do that anymore. I mean, the last couple of years we haven't been able to, but I spent a, a few years living in England and a few years living in America and Canada, and I've also had people from overseas come and live here. And so it was <clears throat> influenced by the way that people from outside see our world, the world of Australia, and the way and me also going to their world and seeing them and you get some things wrong there are things that you think are superior about your country and then you learn that there are reasons why they don't have it there and especially the uh especially the idea of technology it's it's um this like you know you go to fiji on holidays and at first you might think oh, everything is moving so slowly. Why aren't these people fast paced like we are in our country? And then really quickly you realize there's so much more joy and happiness and, and what are we doing to ourselves, constraining ourselves with deadlines and things like that. So mm. it's, it's just that idea of seeing things from a different perspective and learning things about yourself as a result. And, and I guess um, there's a bit in there where, Oscar, where they're asking Oscar about his world and Things like the economy and um, and the and the, uh, what, the import export market and all that kind of thing, which um, was a little bit inspired by when I lived in America and people would ask me details of Australian politics and things like that. And <laughs> I didn't read the news much back then. <laughs> and I remember answering their questions and really hoping hoping there's no Australian anywhere nearby to. Um, you know, it's like when you're in a lift with your child and the child asks you some scientific question and <laughs> the people like, why is the sky blue? And you're like, answering the question thinking, I hope there is nobody, like, am I getting this right or not? And <laughs> making some things up. And so that was an aspect of it too. So I did have fun writing Oscar in another world. I, um, I think my favourite thing about the book is Oscar himself is, such a wonderful character I kind of um from very early on in this piece was ready to take a bullet for this little boy oh, cool. he's um just very lovable where did the first little spark of inspiration for Oscar come from the, there's because I've been wanting for a while to write a child who can come from our world into um into the kingdoms and empires at first I when I was half asleep one morning in that kind of dream state I saw a child, a little girl sitting at a piano and she was a very well behaved little girl. And she somehow, because part of the kingdoms and empires is a kingdom called the mellifluous, mellifluous kingdom, which is a musical kingdom. And I thought by playing the piano, she finds her way through to that kingdom. And I kept thinking about this little girl who was very good, but for some reason I couldn't get anywhere. My mind wouldn't take me beyond her sitting at the piano. And I couldn't bring her, I couldn't, she was just still sitting at the piano. And I kept walking around, trying to, walking around the neighborhood, trying to see more of this girl and where she was going and what the story, what was going to happen in the story. And then I walked past the local skate park where my son, he was 12 at the time when I was thinking of this. Um, and he had just become obsessed with skateboarding. And there were a lot of naughty wild boys in the skate park who, the kind of kids who I, maybe before I had a son, I might have been full of disapproval of, and um, judgment. But having gotten to know my son and his friends, I feel like I can see them in a whole new way. And I think we're quite unfair in our judgment of little boys. And and their recklessness and, and wildness, which obviously I have to be careful talking like that because I know um, they, and I'm not suggesting that they can be reckless and wild in a way that harms other people and 
is unfair to girls and so on. So I just mean there's an aspect of it that is exhilarating and exuberant and important. And, and that one of the problems for boys is that the school system does not acknowledge and address the fact that some boys, not all boys obviously, but some boys just have a different way of thinking and a different approach to life, which doesn't work in the classroom. And we are, we are missing out on, and we are crushing their adventurous spirit. So the first child to go to the kingdoms and empires is going to be the most unlikely child of all, someone who doesn't like reading and um, is a wild skateboarding boy who is very much an urban, someone who lives in the urban setting. And partly also that was, it, worked, it fell into place for me when I saw that and felt that recklessness and that exhilaration and also realizing that my son Charlie and his friends were on this quest constantly to find the biggest and best skate park in all of <laughs> And so um, between 12 and 13, they were taking, spending so much time looking at their phones, researching, finding, um, and, and you know, looking at the map app on the phone, figuring out how to get which bus and which train and that's when I thought it's it's like a quest to find another world. I love that so much. I'm sure the good girl who played piano has her own story, but I think I'm really glad that this story was Oscar's because it's so perfect. And there's something just so wonderful about um, being in the kingdoms and empires world with its magical crystal fairies and dragons and selling silver foxes and witches and also having this like kid with a skateboard <laughs> who's just like a little bit um, like totally out of place but also really belonging. You, in this book, as you always do, um, approach some fairly like serious topics. For instance, anxiety and um, the concentration problems that um, Oscar has, I don't know, being ADHD or similar. Um, also child neglect um, you do this in all of your books you approach these topics with like sensitivity but also with a really gentle hand but in an upfront and unflinching way and I've asked you this a million times I feel like I ask you this every time every time we do a podcast together but I'm always fascinated to know how much of a challenge it is to balance all of the light-heartedness and whimsy with those topics you know when the story takes a turn to places that's just a little bit heavier you know you're always able to do it in a way that's sensitive but um you know you'll still find yourself chuckling in those <laughs> in those moments so yeah basically the question Jacqueline is how much hard work is that for you <laughs> like does it come naturally or is it just do you find you, that it's a conscious effort to balance those two things it's really lovely of you to ask that question i got a, an email from a little girl the other day who asked me um and that wasn't an email it was a school visit where one of the children the children were asking questions and she asked um how do you choose the morals and messages that you put in your book and how do you choose how to put morals and messages in your book and my answer to both of them was, I don't, I never start by choosing a moral or a message. And so I, and I didn't start at all. And I, I, I think that you can tell if an author has chosen a moral or message that it becomes too obvious. And then you, um, it, you turn against it and you, it, it takes away from the story because foremost there has to be the narrative and the characters and the plot that's what counts it's a story that counts and any yeah. messages that come up and any issues such as anxiety or ADHD that came up they were not in there from the start for me they were things that I understood that seemed to emerge and that I and I and I'm always annoyed with authors when they do this. No, I'm not annoyed with authors, but I don't. I'm annoyed with myself if I hear myself saying something like, "It was there, and I 
only recognized it, that kind of thing can be really annoying, that kind of idea of within the story, this emerged and my characters became, I always find that annoying myself when I do that. But I think it might be true, but I realized as I was writing and it, and so it's, if it's working and that's very kind of you to say it is, it's, it's luck, I think, that I, I don't think I can take the credit for it. It just felt like if I let myself be with these, all I do is try and take myself out of it and, and not have too much of a, an overarching controlling voice myself and allow the characters to emerge and be themselves. And, and so they, as children, would only really touch on these big issues and need to address them in some ways, but it would also be important for them as children to make jokes about it and to move on and, and not to linger. And so they're the ones who, if it, if it is successful at all, it's because of those children making that happen. Oh, I, I couldn't help but notice, being a big uh, fan of all of your all of your books, I couldn't help but notice in this one that there's a really tantalising little mention of the Kingdom of Cello, <laughs> and um, I just it just made me wonder: Do you ever? Okay, so actually, the overall question is, what's up next to you? And as a sub question of that is, do you think ever in the future that you would maybe um, revisit the Kingdom of Cello and the characters from Colors of Madeline? Oh, it's so nice of you to notice the kind of cello in there. I don't know how many people <laughs> noticed that. But when I said earlier, the whole time that I um, was writing it, I wanted a child from our world to get into that world. Another thing that has been present in my mind the whole time I've been writing these books is that this is all taking place in the southern part of the kingdoms and empires in the southern climes. In the northern climes, there is the kingdom of cello, which featured in the Colors of Madeline books and partly that's because um, I feel like I'm getting in sideways trying to find my way back to the Kingdom of Cello. A lot of people seem to find them a bit too strange but I always thought what do you mean they're not strange? I think it might be that I'm strange myself and I don't realize it so I don't mean to be weird but uh, <laughs> I thought they were perfectly normal books but anyway so as Originally, I had wanted to write lots of other books about the Kingdom of Cello and they did win prizes and they got nice critical response and there are some lovely people around the world who, who like them, but they were kind of niche and small and those publishers said, no more Kingdom of Cello books, be realistic. <laughs> <laughs> so I did switch, I, I do love those publishers, they were just being commercial, but I switched publishers because I thought, they gave me very sensible advice and they said you sell best when you write realistic and I said okay thank you very much and I went home and wrote another completely fantasy book <laughs> and because I feel like you have to write what is close to your heart and magic to you and and I might write realistic teen fiction again one day because I enjoy that too but that's this is what I wanted to be doing and so this is my tricky way of eventually I want to get back to the kingdom of cello and so this is my way I each book I think I wonder if this is the book and each book I think no I'm not quite ready for it and your other part of that question was what's next and what is next is I'm halfway through writing another book um, about the kingdoms and empires which is about a very good little girl who plays the piano oh my gosh I'm so keen for her story <laughs> I love her now. It was so strange how before she just wasn't ready. And this is called, about a girl named Lillian Velvet, who um, is a good girl who plays the piano and loves to read books. She's nothing like me now, but she was at the beginning. And, and she lives in our world and she is finding her way in all kinds of different ways into the kingdoms and empires. Oh, wow. I'm so pleased to hear that. I really love the Kingdom and Empire series and it's, it fascinates me to hear you say, you know, that in my mind, I think that all of your books are equally successful and like, <laughs> and um, I just want to say to anyone who might be listening to this, 
what it, I haven't read the Colors of Madeline series, you know, if you love Kingdom and Empire, you will love Colors of Madeline and you should go and read them immediately. Um, and I and particularly Oscar's book, I feel like really had that that same vibe. Um, but we're we're kind of out of time. So Jacqueline, thanks so much for joining us today. I've loved speaking to you about this book. I always love speaking to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, and um, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for being so kind about the book and for asking great questions. For everyone listening, you can grab your copy of all of Jacqueline Moriarty's amazing backlist titles at your local bookstore or online at Booktopia. Thanks for listening and never stop reading. Now over to Stefania for her conversation with Lisa Wilkinson. I'm Stefania Caponia, Booktopia's non-fiction category manager. I'm delighted to be speaking with Australia's youngest ever magazine editor, as well as one of its most admired and popular media personalities, Lisa Wilkinson. Hi, Lisa. Hi there. Welcome and congratulations on the book. Thank Um, you. Today we're discussing your long-awaited autobiography, It Wasn't Meant to Be Like This. So personally, I found your book both nostalgic and bittersweet. Um, it took me right back to being a young girl um, growing up in southwestern Sydney like you, <laughs> reading Dolly and dreaming about leaving school forever. But it also reminded me about all the ways that women have advanced since our mother's generation, but also how far we still have to go in this country for women. You've summed it up perfectly. <laughs> I've, I've really tried in the book to show that, that arc of my life, the six decades um, that, and, and how the change that I've seen throughout my life has, has come about, how it affected me, and therefore every woman my age, and for women younger than me, how far we have come. But as you say, we still have a long way to go, which is why I finished the book with um, having met Brittany Higgins when she contacted me earlier this year and was deciding whether or not she wanted to go public with her story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and the, the book actually begins earlier than me. It begins yeah. with the birth of my mother in 1928. She was born to uh, a, a single mother at the age of 16 who was shunned by the... Um, the father's family because my maternal grandfather was actually a senator in our federal parliament and a fine upstanding citizen, a Catholic family. And so my mother and and her single mother were shunned from the family. My mother was um, in and out of orphanages all of her childhood. But, you know, back in those days, your plan was a man and my mother, fortunately, with, with very few skills, met an angel in the form of my father when she was 21 and, you know, had, had a largely very happy marriage with dad. And I grew up in the southwestern suburbs of Sydney, you know, watching all those shows after school that we all watched, like Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie and Mary Tyler Moore, which really set me on my course of I really wanted to become a journalist after watching Mary Tyler Moore. But as I detail in the book, one of the things that I learnt watching those afternoon sitcoms is the woman was always kind of painted as, you know, a bit a bit like, you know, she was always pretty much a housewife, leaving Mary Tyler Moore aside. She was a housewife. Um, the men, you know, were kind of the heroes, but the men were also a bit hapless. And so often the, there was a common denominator where if the woman just worked out a way to negotiate around men, it was amazing how often in those sitcoms the woman came out on top but you just had to be smarter than the men. And that's what I've been trying to do ever since. Thank you very much, Samantha from Bewitched. Although I was going to say, I'm sure there's a lot of women working in marketing at the moment who um, were inspired by Samantha on Bewitched. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so you write about going to school in the Western suburbs 
Can you um, tell us a little bit about what life was like for you at Campbelltown High in the 1970s? Look, my, you know, I went to the local public school. I did, I did 13 years um, at the local infants, the local primary, the local high school. And I loved school right up until about year nine, end of, end of year eight into year nine, when I was targeted by the school bullies in my year. And it was relentless. And I feared going to school every day. The violence became physical. And, and I talk about those moments in the book. And in many ways, it, it sort of charted a bit of a course for me because what you do when you're bullied is you want to disappear between the cracks. You don't want to do anything that's going to attract attention. So after, you know, being in all the top classes and always doing my homework and had so many great teachers, I let my my schooling slip as well and I I was planning on being a ballerina up until that point and I was very darn good and but the bullies didn't like you if you were a ballerina and I, and I stopped doing that and I'd, I'd been doing it since the age of five so I tried to disappear uh, those girls as they so often do um, left school they, they had no interest in schooling and I ended up staying until year 12, but I was always still going every day to the place that was a backdrop for me for so much pain. Mm -hmm. And on my final day, when I did my last exam in year 12, I walked out of those gates of that school. And, and I must say, I had some really good friends who are still my friends to this day from that school but I was so good at hiding everything from them from my parents I turned to no one I just I kept thinking if I pretend it doesn't exist it won't exist but you know when you get a right hook to the head and you know kids in the playground are calling out fight 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 it's kind of hard to forget but when I walked out of school on that final day I made a promise to myself that never again would I allow someone else to determine who I was and what I was capable of? And so I went to business college because I wanted to get shorthand and typing because I, I thought if I work really hard for a year, I might get a job as an executive assistant, maybe somewhere close to the media so I can get a sense of what that's like, but that's probably pie in the sky. And then I'm gonna go traveling for a couple of years to get my head out of myself, see the world, you know, experience everything that the world has to offer, offer as I go backpacking. And then I'll come back and I'll have stories to tell. I'll have lived, you know, lots of different experiences. And then I might be okay to be a journalist. But the very first day I went looking for a job after business college, um, I went looking in the women and girls employment <laughs> section of the Sydney Morning Herald because back in those days, that's what they did. They split it up into gender. And you can imagine um, the length of the women and girls section compared to the men and boys section. So I got to the letter D very quickly. And there was a tiny, completely unassuming three line ad that I should have, I thought should have had lights around it that said Dolly Magazine is looking for a secretary stroke editorial assistant stroke girl Friday who is prepared to do absolutely anything. Phone Kathy on 699-3622. You still remember the number. <laughs> I do. And I called Kathy, and as I outline in the book, yeah. um, it was a harrowing hour yeah. um, when I called Kathy. And somehow, out of all those girls who would have answered that ad, I mean, I had seven years worth of back copies of Dolly under my bed that yeah. I never would have thrown out and I've still got them. They're in our so right. yeah. and, and my old Cleos. <laughs> yep. And because they were such a comfort for young Australian girls, they were a trusted source of information. And I, you know, I would read my monthly issue of Dolly 15 times over. I would just keep going back to them because it felt like such a safe space. 
And so when I applied for the job, I knew Dolly inside out, upside down, back to front. The editor was in her mid fifties. And it's so amazing to me how so not old she sounds these days. <laughs> but she was, she was, you know, there's no, no getting around it. She was out of touch. Yeah. Um, and the magazine was in a bit of trouble. It had lost a lot of readership. But I knew exactly how to fix it up. And I was so enthusiastic from day one that, you know, I found my passion very early on. So I never did get to go backpacking in Europe because I kept getting these incredible opportunities because I, I put my hand up for every job that was going, got a cadetship, um, and within two and a half years of, of joining, I was offered the editorship. And it was just like, 21. wow. So what was that like, being the editor of one of the most popular magazines in the country at such a young age? terrifying <laughs> in a word because what I also knew is you know I I got this incredible opportunity um, and but I I made sure that I knew everything there was to know about the magazine and but I'd been thrust into this role so quickly that nobody had thought to teach me any of the rules so I wrote a few of my own yes. <laughs> and, and probably broke plenty, I am sure. But I decided <laughs> that if I was to put my head up and listen to the noise that was probably out there uh, from other fully trained up journalists in the building working on all the other magazines like Woman's Day and Cosmopolitan and Electronics Australia and Woman's <laughs> World and all of these magazines, that what I probably would have heard if I'd cocked my ear was who the hell does this trumped up little typist think she is? <laughs> the truth is I was thinking the same thing, <laughs> but I had to just trust my gut instincts and just go for it because I knew I would get one chance at this and one chance only. And nobody thought I would do a good job. So I had nothing to lose. So I just went for it. And, you know, I even did things, and this was a couple of years after I became editor, you know, it was, if anybody who's listening to this remembers the Move Milk Girl ads, and it was all blonde beach babes and, you know, it was, it, it was, a, it was a very specific Australian look. And the magazine was doing so well by 1983 that I'd stopped going and showing my covers to to the managing director of the business because, you know, all of those crusty old white guys who were on the board of Fairfax had no clue why Dolly's sales had skyrocketed. They just knew that they'd thrown this young girl in and somehow she seemed to know what she was doing. So don't anybody get in her way. And, and that worked well for me. But I didn't go and check with them in July of 1983 when I put a 15-year-old, completely unknown, corkscrew-curled redhead on the cover who had the most gorgeous freckles on planet Earth. Um, but I did right at the very last minute because I thought, I don't think they're going to be happy with this. But I made sure I had it at a point where it was heading off to the presses anyway. And I just went and showed the managing director. I just put the picture on his desk and he looked at it and said, she's got red hair. <laughs> and I said, I know, isn't it great? And he said, hang on, as he peered in a little more closely, she's got, are they freckles? And I said, yeah, aren't they gorgeous? And he said, that's not gonna sell, you can't run that. And I said, you know what? I think it is gonna sell and it's already gone. <laughs> And of course, it was Nicole Kidman. Yeah. And it was the very first time. I mean, how many covers do you reckon she's had in the years since? Um, so, you know, and, and that was my first ever sellout of the magazine. So it was wonderful to be learning to be a magazine editor and taking young Australian teenagers along with me. And I'm, I'm so pleased that in releasing the book, the number of journalists who've told me that they got their start in Dolly in the Poets' Corner pages, yes. including people like Lisa Miller, the yes, host sorry, of yes. ABC Breakfast. So, 
it's just, we were all in this tribe together. And I was just lucky enough to be holding hands with young Australian women at a really formative moment in their lives and in mine. You had a, a like you were saying, you had a great instinct. So the, the person who, who photographed Nicole Kidman was someone called Graham Shearer. Yeah. So where did your instinct come to, you had an interesting um, way of hiring him. Can you explain a little bit who he was and what he meant for the fashion industry in Australia? Well, when, when I took over at Dolly, one of the things that I never understood was that we had to use this centralised photographic department uh, because they were all these photographers who were really good at taking photos of transistor radios <laughs> and close-ups of, you know, avocado cocktails and tomato bakes for Woman's Day. But in terms of getting any kind of elevated fashion photography that had a, a style and a verve and an energy that I wanted to see reflected in, in our pages, they weren't the guys and they were all guys. And I kept asking, can I use freelance photographers like the team at Cosmo do? And it was always a no. So I had to work with those guys for the first year and a half, I think it was. But I used to want to see the models that were coming in, the young models that we would put in our pages. And so often when I would go through their portfolios, I kept seeing these great photos. And I would always say, who took that photo? And the same name kept coming up and it was Graham Shearer. And one day I was sitting in my office, which was not an office at all. It was, I was behind a sheet of toilet glass. <laughs> like it was so low budget and it was great. I love that it was low budget. As a girl from Campbelltown, I would never have been comfortable in any kind of glossy work environment. But the door opened and I thought I heard a dog bark. <laughs> and then I looked around the toilet glass and I saw this scruffy looking guy in board shorts. He'd clearly just come from the beach. The dog had a bandana around its neck. It was this like tiger from the Brady Bunch. And I heard this guy say, is Lisa Wilkinson here? And I thought, I don't, don't have any appointments with anyone. I wonder who that is. And he said, oh, my name's Graham Shearer. And I raced to the door and got him to come in. And he was just starting out as a photographer. And what photographers want are tear sheets from magazines, editorial, because that gets them the big bucks for advertising jobs. So Graham had something he wanted from me, which was editorial work. And, and I, he had something I wanted from him, which is great photography. So we did a deal. I did some um, uh, creative accounting. <laughs> I said to Graham, I tell you what, I already pay for the film that all the photographers use here in the photographic department, uh, but I can't pay you any money. But what we'll do... We'll, we'll wait six months. I will give you tear sheet after tear sheet. You can shoot everything, our covers, all of our fashion, all of our beauty. You'll get more tear sheets than you know what to do with. But can you do it for free, but I'll pay all of your costs. And then once the sales go up, I am going to get you a great deal. And sure enough, from the minute Graham's photographs started appearing on the cover and in the pages, the circulation went through the roof. And, you know, I had the Fairfax board by the short and curlies, not to put too <laughs> much a point on it. And they were uncomfortable with the idea that, you know, um, I, I might be in a position where that was not going to continue to happen with the circulation. So, yeah, sometimes you've just got to see a challenge and work your way around it. It's amazing at such a young age to have thought of something like that. I'm a girl from Campbelltown. Oh, yes. You know, you just, you go for it. You don't know what the rules are because yeah. I didn't go to private school. I didn't go to university. Yeah. I just, you know, I managed to survive some tough years at school and I did leave school with a blank canvas. And I just thought I've got, if nothing. you've got nothing to lose. And also, if, and it's, it's happened right throughout my life when I've been in situations that have been really challenging. I've always known who I am, and I am that girl that, that 
grew up in Campbelltown, with, you know, with a really loving family. And I've never defined myself by any of the, you know, quite public roles that I've had. I've always been that girl. And, you know, and now I'm still that girl, but I've, I've been married for almost 30 years. I've got three kids. My family are my priority. And when all of that falls away, as it always does, and when someone comes and taps you on the shoulder, as they did at Channel 9, I've always known that I will be okay because what counts is the people who, who genuinely love me and would support me no matter what. Someone did tap you on the shoulder while you're at Dolly. Kerry. <laughs> so Kerry Packer came knocking on your door. Can you tell us a little bit about that first meeting? Well, he didn't come knocking on my door. His 2IC, a guy by the name of Trevor Kennedy, approached me over the phone and it was right after... Um, you know, we'd, we'd almost tripled the circulation of Dolly um, in four and a half years. And <laughs> the, um, the managing director, I hadn't had a pay rise pretty much since I'd become the editor. You know, it was, it, it was leave that girl alone. She's doing a great job. Let's just count the money. But they left me alone also when it came to pay rises. <laughs> um, and, and I went and asked for a pay rise. And after you know, a, a long sort of negotiation. Well, in fact, he'd approved a $20 pay rise many, many months before, but never told me about it. So I, I was getting 20 extra dollars a week. And I remember, I, I just thought at the time, so apart from the fact that $20 given the amount of money I'm making for you is pretty kind of, it's a pat on the head and go away, dear. I also thought you knew that I could have a pay rise and you didn't give it to me. And I walked back into my office and the most extraordinary thing happened. My assistant had left a note on my desk, it was a Friday afternoon, to say that a guy called Trevor Kennedy had called and here's his number. And I knew that Trevor Kennedy was Kerry Packer's right-hand man. And I called the number, Trevor said he wanted to have lunch with me. We had lunch. We got on like a house on fire. And he told me Kerry Packer wanted to meet me. And I told Trevor, well, I don't really want to meet Kerry Packer. I'm very happy working at Fairfax. Dolly's going gangbusters. Why would I want to go and work for a man with such a fierce reputation? You know, I just, no. And he said, look, just come and have lunch with him. It's fine. Just meet him and, and it'll be fine. Anyway, I just thought, I don't want to die wondering. I, I want to be able to one day tell my grandkids that I met the great Kerry Packer. And at every barbecue I ever went to after this, I wanted to say what he looked like, how tall he was, <laughs> what he ate, what he said to me, what I said to him. And so I arrived at this prearranged address the following Friday down at Sydney's Darling Harbour. And I, I never did lunch. I never did red carpets. I didn't know where I was going. I just had an address. But the address was actually a, a sort of a giant asphalt almost parking lot with cyclone wire fencing around it. And behind that were the whirring blades of the Channel 9 helicopter, ready and waiting, I discovered, to whisk me up to Mr Packer's summer residence at Palm Beach. Now, I had never been in a helicopter before and I told my assistant, Lisa, that I'd be an hour <laughs> and I was clearly not going to be an hour. And I just thought, what the hell? I'm going to get in a helicopter and go to Palm Beach. I don't know what's going to happen, but I may as well. And Trevor came with me and um, look, you can read the entire account in the book, but it involved a whole lot of seagull poo yeah. <laughs> on my feet at the moment that I met Kerry Packer when he um, greeted me at the top of the jetty steps. Um, at in in um, at Pittwater, and I went and sat on the front veranda of his very palatial summer residence at Palm Beach, and found myself negotiating to become the editor of Cleo. And I said to him, "I'm not here to negotiate. I don't want to work for you." As my girlfriend had told me that morning, who was one of the only people I'd told that I was meeting Kerry Packer, because um, I'd been throwing up. <laughs> out of fear that I was going to meet this guy. And she said to me, you know, why? Let him try and impress you. You've already got a job. 
And if that doesn't work, just do what I do whenever I meet somebody intimidating. Just think of him naked. <laughs> so that kind of worked for me. <laughs> and anyway, lo and behold, by the end of the lunch, uh, I'd said to him, because there was, Cleo was a really iconic publication in this country. It's, it's hard to overestimate how yeah. important that was for Australian women in this second wave of feminism that was happening in the 70s. Cleo was born in 1972 on this real wave of feminism launched by the incredible Ita Buttrose. You know, it told women they could do anything. You know, they, they didn't need to define their lives through the lens of a man and what he can earn and what he thinks. And, you know, a man was no longer a plan. You could be independent. You could study. You could be a politician. You have to sort your finances. Um, you are in charge of your own body and your own life and you have agency. So even though by the mid-'80s the magazine had, had moved on a bit from that, I still felt that there were things to do with this magazine. And my problem was telling him that as I sat on that veranda and he liked the sound of my ideas. The only problem was I didn't tell him that I wanted to get rid of the centerfold. And he found that out three months later. Inevitably, I did accept the job three months later. And I thought he was overseas. But on the very first day that the, my very first issue went on sale, um, unbeknownst to me, he had returned from overseas and was at, at home watching his own Nine Network and his own Ray Martin introduce his own Clio editor onto the set of the midday show and me proudly announced that I had just got rid of the centrefold. Um, Kerry told me that I could do whatever I wanted with the magazine, but he then told me when he called the green room as soon as I got off air, um, that he was unaware that I was dropping the centrefold, even though Trevor told me he had told him. Um, and he basically said to me, you better effing know what you're doing and then hung up. Um, after I had told him if, because I, I figured I, I, once again, I had one shot at telling Kerry Packer what I thought. And I said to him in that phone call, are you kidding me? Anyone who works in magazines and knows anything about what Australian women want, who thinks that keeping this centrefold after 13 years, which has become a complete and utter joke, has no clue about Australian audiences. Um, and that was when he said to me, well, you better effing know what you're doing and hung up. Fortunately, we took Clio to become the number one selling women's lifestyle magazine per capita in the world. So I won. <laughs> <laughs> so did you ever think back then as a young editor discussing women's issues, standing up to Kerry Packer, that decades later we'd still be having these same conversations about violence to women, inequality at work, body objectification, um, still being judged on our looks and what we wear? Did you ever think that that would be the case? I think part of the problem is we weren't telling the truth of our stories in those days. Uh, and, you know, as, as you probably know, um, I interviewed Brittany Higgins yeah. earlier this year. She came to me in mid-January and told me her story. And we put her story to air in, on the project in mid-February. And what I witnessed after Brittany stood up so courageously and put her whole story on the line is I was inundated with messages from women telling me their stories as well. And I think as, as a nation of women, what we have realised this year is we have been keeping men's secrets for far too long and we have stayed silent for too long. And there's a very good reason for that. It's because the way the world has worked is that the boys club that has sat at the, t at the top all this time has made sure that to, to stay silent is the easier option and you risk not being believed. But we've all, we've all 
linked arms this year and realize that we all have to listen. And if we are comfortable with telling our stories, we must, because we all realize, and I am a survivor of sexual assault, which I have out, outlined and detailed in the book. And I wasn't going to include that story in the book until I met Brittany. But unless we tell the truth of our stories, the extent of the abuse and the harassment and the diminishment of women uh, is not known. Well, congratulations, by the way, about the, the story and um, being um, nominated for the Walkley Award. I know. I, it, it's... It, you know, in, in many ways, I feel like I had to be a journalist for 40 years to prepare myself to, to do that story justice. And, yeah, I've, I've never... Well, I was nominated for a, a, um, a mid-year Walkley mm. in the middle of the year, but, um, yeah, two Walkley nominations. I'm, I'm so deeply honoured. And it's all due to the courage of Brittany and mm. telling her story so eloquently and courageously. And I think for so many women and all survivors of, of sexual assault, both male and female, you look at a young woman like that who's prepared to risk everything um, and keep standing tall and strong uh, and, and it's impossible not to be inspired. On that note, we've reached our 30 minute mark. I'm really <laughs> sorry, I still have so many questions to, to ask. We might have and to do a part two. I know. The book, look, the book is amazing. Like you said, mm -hmm. your life is so full. There's so much to cover. Um, but thank you so much for your time today. It was a Bye. pleasure. For all our listeners at home, I hope you enjoyed listening to Lisa as much as I have. Um, you can go and buy your copy of um, It Wasn't Meant to Be Like This at your local bookstore or you can order it online from Booktopia. Thank you again for listening and never stop reading. Thanks to our guests, Christian White, Jacqueline Moriarty and Lisa Wilkinson. You can find links to the books discussed today in our show notes or head over to booktopia.com.au. Stay tuned on Friday for our next episode where we'll be discussing the books we're reading at the moment. And please join us for next week's interview show where we'll be talking with Fiona McIntosh and Shane Janak, a.k.a. Courtney Act. As always, thanks for listening and never stop reading. Bye.